Section seventy of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one, part one, seventeen fifty eight to seventeen sixty three. The Peace of Paris. In accordance with the terms of the capitulation of Montreal, the French military officers with such of the soldiers as could be kept together, as well as all the chief civil officers of the colony, sailed for France in vessels provided by the conquerors. They were voluntarily followed by the principal members of the Canadian noblesse, and by many of the merchants who had no mind to swear allegiance to King George. The peasants, and poorer colonists remained at home to begin a new life under a new flag. Though this exodus of the natural leaders of Canada was in good part deferred till the next year, and though the number of persons to be immediately embarked was reduced by the desertion of many French soldiers who had married Canadian wives, Yet the English authorities were sorely perplexed to find vessels enough for the motley crowd of passengers. When at last they were all on their way, a succession of furious autumnal storms fell upon them. The ship that carried Levis barely escaped wreck, and that which bore Vaudreuil and his wife fared little better. Worst of all was the fate of the Auguste, on board of which was the bold but ruthless partisan, Saint-Luc de la Corne, his brother, his children, and a party of Canadian officers, together with ladies, merchants, and soldiers. A worthy ecclesiastical chronicler paints the unhappy vessel as a floating Babylon, and sees in her fate the stern judgment of heaven. It is true that New France ran riot in the last years of her existence, but before the Auguste was well out of the St. Lawrence, she was so tossed and buffeted, so lashed with waves and pelted with rain, that the most alluring forms of sin must have lost their charm, and her inmates passed days rather of penance than transgression. There was a violent storm as the ship entered the gulf, then a calm during which she took fire in the cook's galley. The crew and passengers subdued the flames after desperate efforts, but their only food thenceforth was dry biscuit. Off the coast of Cape Breton another gale rose, they lost their reckoning and lay tossing blindly amid the tempest. The exhausted sailors took in despair to their hammocks, from which neither commands nor blows could rouse them, while amid shrieks, tears, prayers, and vows to heaven, the Auguste drove towards the shore, struck and rolled over on her side. La Corne, with six others, gained the beach, and towards night they saw the ship break asunder, and counted a hundred and fourteen corpses strewn along the sand. Aided by Indians and English officers, La Corne made his way on snowshoes up the St. John, and by a miracle of enduring hardihood reached Quebec before the end of winter. The other ships weathered the November gales and landed their passengers on the shores of France, where some of them found a dismal welcome, being seized and thrown into the Bastille. These were Vaudreuil, Bigot, Cadet, Péon, Bréard, Varin, Le Mercier, Penisseau, Morin, Corpron, and others accused of the frauds and peculations that had helped to ruin Canada. In the next year they were all put on trial, whether as an act of pure justice, 
or as a device to turn public indignation from the government. In December 1761, judges commissioned for the purpose began their sessions at the Châtelet, and a prodigious mass of evidence was laid before them. Cadet, with brazen effrontery, at first declared himself innocent, but ended with full and unblushing confession. Bigot denied everything till silenced point by point with papers bearing his own signature. The prisoners defended themselves by accusing each other. Bigot and Vaudreuil brought mutual charges, while all agreed in denouncing Cadet. Vaudreuil, as before mentioned, was acquitted. Bigot was banished from France for life. His property was confiscated, and he was condemned to pay 1,500,000 francs by way of restitution. Cadet was banished for nine years from Paris, and required to refund six millions, while others were sentenced in sums varying from 30,000 to 800,000 francs, and were ordered to be held in prison till the money was paid. Of twenty-one persons brought to trial, ten were condemned, six were acquitted, three received an admonition, and two were dismissed for want of evidence. Thirty-four failed to appear, of whom seven were sentenced in default, and judgment was reserved in the case of the rest. Even those who escaped from justice profited little by their gains, for unless they had turned them betimes into land or other substantial values, they lost them in a discredited paper currency and dishonored bills of exchange. While on the American continent the last scenes of the war were drawing to their close, the contest raged in Europe with unabated violence. England was in the full career of success, but her great ally, Frederick of Prussia, seemed tottering to his ruin. In the summer of 1758 his glory was at its height. French, Austrians, and Russians had all fled before him, but the autumn brought reverses and the Austrian general, Dawn, at the head of an overwhelming force, gained over him a partial victory which his masterly strategy robbed of its fruits. It was but a momentary respite. His kingdom was exhausted by its own triumphs. His best generals were dead, his best soldiers killed or disabled, his resources almost spent. The very chandeliers of his palace melted into coin, and all Europe was in arms against him. The disciplined valor of the Prussian troops and the supreme leadership of their undespairing king had thus far held the invading hosts at bay. But now the end seemed near. Frederick could not be everywhere at once, and while he stopped one leak, the torrent poured in at another. The Russians advanced again, defeated General Weddell, whom he sent against them, and made a junction with the Austrians. In August 1759 he attacked their united force at Kunersdorf, broke their left wing to pieces, took a hundred and eighty cannon, forced their centre to give ground, and after hours of furious fighting was overwhelmed at last. In vain he tried to stop the rout. The bullets killed two horses under him, tore his clothes, and crushed a gold snuff-box in his waistcoat pocket. Is there no bee of a shot that can hit me then? he cried in his bitterness as his aide-de-camp forced him from the field. For a few days he despaired, then rallied to his forlorn task, and, 
with smiles on his lip and anguish at his heart, watched, maneuvered, and fought with cool and stubborn desperation. To his friend Dargin he wrote soon after his defeat, Death is sweet in comparison to such a life as mine. Have pity on me and it. Believe that I still keep to myself a great many evil things, not wishing to afflict or disgust anybody with them, and that I would not counsel you to fly these unlucky countries if I had any ray of hope. Adieu, mon cher. It is well for him and for Prussia that he had strong allies in the dissensions and delays of his enemies. But his cup was not yet full. Dresden was taken from him, eight of his remaining generals and twelve thousand men were defeated and captured at Maxen, and this infernal campaign, as he called it, closed in thick darkness. I wrap myself in stoicism as best I can, he writes to Voltaire. If you saw me, you would hardly know me. I am old, broken, gray-headed, wrinkled. If this goes on, there will be nothing left of me but the mania of making verses and an inviolable attachment to my duties and to the few virtuous men I know but you will not get a peace signed by my hand except on conditions honourable to my nation. Your people, blown up with conceit and folly, may depend on this. The same stubborn conflict with overmastering odds, the same intrepid resolution, the same subtle strategy, the same skill in eluding the blow and lightning-like quickness in retorting it, marked Frederick's campaign of 1760. At Leignitz, three armies, each equal to his own, closed around him, and he put them all to flight. While he was fighting in Silesia, the Allies marched upon Berlin, took it, and held it three days, but withdrew on his approach. For him there was no peace. Why weary you with the details of my labors and sorrows? He wrote again to his faithful Dargent. My spirits have forsaken me. All gaiety is buried with the loved noble ones to whom my heart was bound. He had lost his mother and his devoted sister Wilhelmina. You, as a follower of Epicurus, put a value upon life. As for me, I regard death from the stoic point of view. I have told you, and I repeat it, never shall my hand sign a humiliating peace. Finish this campaign I will, resolved to dare all to succeed or find a glorious end. Then came the victory of Torgau, the last and one of the most desperate of his battles a success dearly bought, and bringing neither rest nor safety. Once more he wrote to Dargen, Adieu, dear Marquis, write to me sometimes. Don't forget a poor devil who curses his fatal existence ten times a day. I live like a military monk, endless business and a little consolation from my books. I don't know if I shall outlive this war, but if I do, I am firmly resolved to pass the rest of my life in solitude in the bosom of philosophy and friendship. Your nation, you see, is blinder than you thought. These fools will lose their Canada and Pondicherry to please the Queen of Hungary and the Tsarina. The campaign of 1761 was mainly defensive on the part of Frederick. In the exhaustion of his resources, he could see no means of continuing the struggle. It is only fortune, says the royal sceptic, that can extricate me from the situation I am in. 
I escape out of it by looking at the universe on the great scale like an observer from some distant planet. All then seems to be so infinitely small that I could almost pity my enemies for giving themselves so much trouble about so very little. I read a great deal. I devour my books. But for them I think hypochondria would have had me in Bedlam before now. In fine, dear Marquis, we live in troublous times and desperate situations. I have all the properties of a stage hero, always in danger, always on the point of perishing, and in another mood I begin to feel that, as the Italians say, revenge is a pleasure for the gods. My philosophy is worn out by suffering. I am no saint, and I will own that I should die content if only I could first inflict a part of the misery that I endure. While Frederick was fighting for life and crown, an event took place in England that was to have great influence on the war. Walpole recounts it thus, writing to George Montague on the 25th of October, 1760. My man Harry tells me all the amusing news. He first told me of the late Prince of Wales's death, and today of the King's, so I must tell you all I know of departed majesty. He went to bed well last night, rose at six this morning, looked, I suppose, if all his money was in his purse, and called for his chocolate. A little after seven he went into the closet. The German valet de chambre heard a noise, listened, heard something like a groan, ran in, and found the hero of Oudenard and Dettingen on the floor, with a gash on his right temple by falling against the corner of a bureau. He tried to speak, could not, and expired. The great ventricle of the heart had burst. What an enviable death! The old king was succeeded by his grandson, George the Third a mirror of domestic virtues, conscientiousness, obstinate, narrow. His accession produced political changes that had been preparing for some time. His grandfather was German at heart, loved his continental kingdom of Hanover, and was eager for all measures that looked to its defense and preservation. Pitt, too, had of late vigorously supported the Continental War, saying that he would conquer America in Germany. Thus, with differing views, the King and the Minister had concurred in the same measures. But George the Third was English by birth, language, and inclination. His ruling passion was the establishment and increase of his own authority. He disliked Pitt, the representative of the people. He was at heart averse to a war, the continuance of which would make the great commoner necessary, and therefore powerful, and he wished for a peace that would give free scope to his schemes for strengthening the prerogative. He was not alone in his pacific inclinations. The enemies of the haughty minister, who had ridden roughshod over men far above him in rank, were tired of his ascendancy, and saw no hope of ending it but by ending the war. Thus a peace party grew up, and the young king became its real, though not at first, its declared supporter. The Tory party, long buried, showed signs of resurrection. There were those amongst its members who, even in a king of the hated line of Hanover, could recognize and admire the same spirit of arbitrary domination that had marked their fallen idols, the Stuarts, and they now joined hands with the discontented Whigs in opposition to Pitt. The horrors of war, the blessings of peace, the weight of taxation, 
the growth of the national debt, were the rallying cries of the new party. But the mainspring of their zeal was hostility to the great minister. Even his own colleagues chafed under his spirit of mastery. The chiefs of the opposition longed to inherit his power, and the king had begun to hate him as a lion in his path. Pitt held to his purpose regardless of the gathering storm. That purpose, as proclaimed by his adherents, was to secure a solid and lasting peace, which meant the reduction of France to so low an estate that she could no more be a danger to her rival. In this he had the sympathy of the great body of the nation. Early in 1761, the king, a fanatic for prerogative, set his enginery in motion. The elections for the new parliament were manipulated in his interest. If he disliked Pitt as the representative of the popular will, he also disliked his colleagues, the shuffling and uncertain Newcastle, as the representative of a too powerful nobility. Elements hostile to both were introduced into the cabinet and the great offices. The king's favourite, the Earl of Bute, supplanted Holderness as Secretary of State for the Northern Department. Charles Townsend, an opponent of Pitt, was made Secretary of War. Legg, Chancellor of the Exchequer, was replaced by Viscount Barrington, who was sure for the King, while a place in the Cabinet was also given to the Duke of Bedford, one of the few men who dared face the formidable minister. It was the policy of the king and his following to abandon Prussia, hitherto supported by British subsidies, make friends with Austria and Russia at her expense, and conclude a separate peace with France. France was in sore need of peace. The infatuation that had turned her from her own true interest to serve the passions of Maria Theresa and the Tsarina Elizabeth had brought military humiliation and financial ruin. Abbe de Bernice, Minister of Foreign Affairs, had lost the favour of Madame de Pompadour and had been supplanted by the Duc de Choiseul. The new minister had gained his place by pleasing the favourite, but he kept it through his own ability and the necessities of the time. The Englishman Stanley, whom Pitt sent to negotiate with him, drew this sketch of his character. Though he may have his superiors, not only in experience of business, but in depth and refinement as a statesman, he is a person of as bold and daring a spirit as any man whatever in our country or in his own. Madame Pompadour has ever been looked upon by all preceding courtiers and ministers as their tutelary deity, under whose auspices only they could exist, and who was as much out of their reach as if she were of a superior class of beings. But this minister is so far from being in subordination to her influence that he seized the first opportunity of depriving her not of an equality, but of any share of power, reducing her to the necessity of applying to him even for those favours that she wants for herself and her dependents. He has effected this great change, which every other man would have thought impossible, in the interior of the court, not by plausibility, flatter, and address, but with a high hand, with frequent railleries and sarcasms, which would have ruined any other, and, in short, by a clear superiority of spirit and resolution. Choiseau was vivacious, brilliant, keen, penetrating, believing nothing, fearing nothing, an easy moralist, an uncertain ally, a hater of priests, light-minded, 
inconstant, yet a kind of patriot, eager to serve France and retrieve her fortunes. End of section 70. Section 71 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31, Part 2. He flattered himself with no illusions. Since we do not know how to make war, he said, we must make peace. And he proposed a congress of all the belligerent powers at Augsburg. At the same time, since the war in Germany was distinct from the maritime and colonial war of France and England, he proposed a separate negotiation with the British court in order to settle the questions between them as a preliminary to the general pacification. Pitt consented, and Stanley went as envoy to Versailles, while Monsieur de Bussy came as envoy to London, and in behalf of Chozoy, offered terms of peace, the first of which was the entire abandonment of Canada to England. But the offers were accompanied by the demand that Spain, which had complaints of its own against England, should be admitted as a party to the negotiation, and even hold in some measure the attitude of a mediator. Pitt spurned the idea with fierce contempt. Time enough to treat all of that, sir, when the Tower of London is taken sword in hand. He bore his part with the ability that never failed him, and with a supreme arrogance that rose to a climax in his demand that the fortress of Dunkirk should be demolished, not because it was any longer dangerous to England, but because the nation would regard its destruction as an internal monument of the yoke imposed on France. Choiseul replied with counter-propositions less humiliating to his nation. When the question of accepting or rejecting them came before the ministry, the views of Pitt prevailed by a majority of one, and to the disappointment of Butte and the King, the conferences were broken off. Choiseul, launched again on the billows of a disastrous war, had seen and provided against the event. Ferdinand the Sixth of Spain had died, and Carlos the Third had succeeded to his throne. Here, as in England, change of kings brought change of policy, while negotiating vainly with Pitt the French minister had negotiated secretly and successfully with Carlos, and the result was the treaty known as the Family Compact, having for its object the union of the various members of the House of Bourbon in common resistance to the growing power of England. It provided that in any future war the kings of France and Spain should act as one towards foreign powers, insomuch that the enemy of either should be the enemy of both, and the Bourbon princes of Italy were invited to join in the covenant. What was more to the present purpose, a special agreement was concluded on the same day, by which Spain bound herself to declare war against England unless that power should make peace with France before the 1st of May, 1762. For the safety of her colonies and her trade, Spain felt it her interest to join her sister nation in putting a check on the vast expansion of British maritime power. She could bring a hundred ships of war to aid the dilapidated navy of France, and the wealth of the Indies to aid her ruined treasury. Pitt divined the secret treaty, and soon found evidence of it. He resolved to demand at once full explanation from Spain, and failing to receive a satisfactory reply, 
attack her at home and abroad before she was prepared. On the 2nd of October he laid his plan before a cabinet council held at a house in St. James Street. There were present the Earl of Bute, the Duke of Newcastle, Earl Granville, Earl Temple, and others of the ministry. Pitt urged his views with great warmth. This, he exclaimed, is the time for humbling the whole house of Bourbon. His brother-in-law, Temple, supported him. Newcastle kept silent. Bute denounced the proposal, and the rest were of his mind. If these views are to be followed, said Pitt, this is the last time I can sit at this board. I was called to the administration of affairs by the voice of the people. To them I have always considered myself as accountable for my conduct, and therefore cannot remain in a situation which makes me responsible for measures I am no longer allowed to guide. Nothing could be more offensive to George the Third and his adherents. The veteran Carteret, Earl Granville, replied angrily, I find the gentleman is determined to leave us, nor can I say I am sorry for it, since otherwise he would certainly have compelled us to leave him. But if he is resolved to assume the office of exclusively advising His Majesty and directing the operations of the war, to what purpose are we called to this council? When he talks of being responsible to the people, he talks the language of the House of Commons, and forgets that at this board he is responsible only to the King. However, though he may possibly have convinced himself of his infallibility, still it remains that we should be equally convinced before we can resign our understandings to his direction or join with him in the measure he proposes. Pitt resigned and his colleagues rejoiced. Power fell to Butte and the Tories, and great was the fall. The mass of the nation was with the defeated minister. On Lord Mayor's day, Butte and Barrington were passing St. Paul's in a coach, which the crowd mistook for that of Pitt, and cheered lustily, till one man, looking in at the window, shouted to the rest, This isn't Pitt, it's Butte, and be damned to him. The cheers turned forthwith to hisses, mixed with cries of No Butte, No Newcastle Salmon, Pitt forever. Handfuls of mud were showered against the coach, and Barrington's ruffles were besmirched with it. The fall of Pitt was like the knell of doom to Frederick of Prussia. It meant abandonment by his only ally, and the loss of the subsidy which was his chief resource. The darkness around him grew darker yet, and not a hope seemed left, when as by miracle the clouds broke and light streamed out of the blackness. The bitterest of his foes, the Sirena Elizabeth, she whom he had called Infami Catin du Nord, died and was succeeded by her nephew, Peter the Third. Here again, as in England and Spain, a new sovereign brought new measures. The young Tsar, simple and enthusiastic, admired the King of Prussia, thought him the paragon of heroes, and proclaimed himself his friend. No sooner was he on the throne than Russia changed front. From the foe of Frederick she became his ally and in the opening campaign of 1762, the army that was to have aided in crushing him was ranged on his side. It was a turn of fortune too sharp and sudden to endure. Ill-balanced and extreme in all things, Peter plunged into headlong reforms, exasperated the clergy and the army, and alienated his wife Catherine, who had hoped to rule in his name. 
and who now saw herself supplanted by his mistress. Within six months he was deposed and strangled. Catherine, one of whose lovers had borne part in the murder, reigned in his stead, conspicuous by the unbridled disorders of her life, and by powers of mind that mark her as the ablest of female sovereigns. If she did not share her husband's enthusiasm for Frederick, neither did she share Elizabeth's hatred of him. He, on his part, taught by hard experience, conciliated instead of insulting her, and she let him alone. Peace with Russia brought peace with Sweden, and Austria with the Germanic Empire stood alone against him. France needed all her strength to hold her own against the mixed English and German force under Ferdinand of Brunswick in the Rhine countries. She made spasmodic efforts to seize upon Hanover, but the result was humiliating defeat. In England, George III pursued his policy of strengthening the prerogative, and, jealous of the Whig aristocracy, attacked it in the person of Newcastle. In vain the old politician had played false with Pitt, and trimmed to please his young master. He was worried into resigning his place in the cabinet, and Bute, the obsequious agent of the royal will, succeeded him as first lord of the treasury. Into his weak and unwilling hands now fell the task of carrying on the war. For the nation, elated with triumphs and full of fight, still called on its rulers for fresh efforts and fresh victories. Pitt had proved a true prophet, and his enemies were put to shame, for the attitude of Spain forced Bute and his colleagues to the open rupture with her which the great minister had vainly urged upon them, and a new and formidable war was now added to the old. Their counsels were weak and half-hearted, but the armies and navies of England still felt the impulsion that the imperial hand of Pitt had given, and the unconquerable spirit that he had roused. This spirit had borne them from victory to victory. In Asia they had driven the French from Pondicherry and all their Indian possessions. In Africa they had wrested from them Gorée and the Senegal country. In the West Indians they had taken Guadeloupe and Dominica. In the European seas they had captured ship after ship, routed and crippled the great fleet of Admiral Conflans, seized Belle Isle and defeated a bold attempt to invade Ireland. The navy of France was reduced to helplessness. Pitt, before his resignation, had planned a series of new operations, including an attack on Martinique, with the other West Indian islands still left to France, and then in turn on the Spanish possessions of Havana, Panama, Manila, and the Philippines. Now, more than ever before, the war appeared in its true character. It was a contest for maritime and colonial ascendancy, and England saw herself confronted by both her great rivals at once. Admiral Rodney sailed for Martinique, and Brigadier Monckton joined him with troops from America. Before the middle of February the whole island was in their hands, and Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent soon shared its fate. The Earl of Albemarle and Admiral Sir George Pocock sailed in early spring on a more important errand, landed in June near Havana with 11,000 soldiers, and attacked Moro Castle, the key of the city. The pitiless sun of the tropic midsummer poured its fierce light and heat on the parched rocks where the men toiled at the trenches. Earth was so scarce that hardly enough could be had to keep the fascines in place. The siege works were little else than a mass of dry faggots, 
and when, after exhausting toil, the grand battery opened on the Spanish defences, it presently took fire, was consumed, and had to be made anew. Fresh water failed, and the troops died by scores from thirst. Fever set in, killed many, and disabled nearly half the army. The sea was strewn with floating corpses, and carrion birds in clouds hovered over the populous graveyards and infected camps. Yet the siege went on. A formidable sally was repulsed. Moro Castle was carried by storm till at length, two months and eight days after the troops landed, Havana fell into their hands. At the same time Spain was attacked at the Antipodes, and the loss of Manila and the Philippines gave her fresh cause to repent her rash compact with France. She was hardly more fortunate near home, for having sent an army to invade Portugal, which was in the interest of England, a small British force, under Brigadier Burgoyne, foiled it and forced it to retire. The tide of British success was checked for an instant in Newfoundland, where a French squadron attacked St. John's and took it with its garrison of sixty men. The news reached Amherst at New York. His brother, Lieutenant Colonel Amherst, was sent to the scene of the mishap. St. John's was retaken, and its late conquerors were made prisoners of war. The financial condition of France was desperate. Her people were crushed with taxation. Her debt grew apace, and her yearly expenditure was nearly double her revenue. Choiseau felt the need of immediate peace, and George the Third and Bute were hardly less eager for it to avert the danger of Pitt's return to power and give free scope to their schemes for strengthening the prerogative. Therefore, in September 1762, negotiations were resumed. The Duke of Bedford was sent to Paris to settle the preliminaries, and the Duc de Nivernois came to London on the same errand. The populace were still for war. Bedford was hissed as he passed through the streets of London, and a mob hooted at the puny figure of Nivernois, as he landed at Dover. The great question was, should Canada be restored? Should France still be permitted to keep a foothold on the North American continent? Ever since the capitulation of Montreal, a swarm of pamphlets had discussed the momentous subject. Some maintained that the acquisition of Canada was not an original object of the war that the colony was of little value and ought to be given back to its old masters, that Guadeloupe should be kept instead, the sugar trade of that island being worth far more than the Canadian fur trade, and lastly, that the British colonists, if no longer held in check by France, would spread themselves over the continent, learn to supply all their own wants, grow independent and become dangerous nor were these views confined to englishmen there were foreign observers who clearly saw that the adhesion of her colonies to great britain would be jeopardized by the extinction of french power in america choiseau warned stanley that they would not fail to shake off their dependence the moment canada should be ceded while thirteen years before the Swedish traveller Calm declared that the presence of the French in America gave the best assurance to Great Britain that his own colonies would remain in due subjection. The most noteworthy argument on the other side was that of Franklin, whose words find a strange commentary in the events of the next few years. He affirmed that the colonies were so jealous of each other that they would never unite against England. If they could not agree to unite against the French and Indians, 
can it reasonably be supposed that there is any danger of their uniting against their own nation, which it is well known they all love much more than they love one another? I will venture to say union amongst them for such a purpose is not merely improbable, it is impossible. That is, he prudently adds, without the most grievous tyranny and oppression, like the bloody rule of Alva in the Netherlands. If Pitt had been in office, he would have demanded terms that must ruin past redemption the maritime and colonial power of France. But Bute was less exacting. In November, the plenipotentiaries of England, France, and Spain agreed on preliminaries of peace, in which the following were the essential points. France ceded to Great Britain, Canada, and all her possessions on the North American continent east of the River Mississippi, except the city of New Orleans and a small adjacent district. She renounced her claims to Acadia and gave up to the conqueror the island of Cape Breton, with all other islands in the Gulf and River of St. Lawrence. Spain received back Havana, and paid for it by the cession of Florida, with all her other possessions east of the Mississippi. France, subject to certain restrictions, was left free to fish in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and off a part of the coast of Newfoundland, and the two little islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon were given her as fishing stations on condition that she should not fortify or garrison them. In the West Indies, England restored the captured islands of Guadeloupe, Marigalante, Desirada, and Martinique, and France ceded Grenada and the Grenadines, while it was agreed that of the so-called neutral islands, St. Vincent, Dominica, and Tobago should belong to England, and St. Lucia to France. In Europe, each side promised to give no more help to its allies in the German war. France restored Menorca, and England restored Belle Isle. France gave up such parts of Hanoverian territory as she had occupied, and evacuated certain fortresses belonging to Prussia, pledging herself at the same time to demolish under the inspection of English engineers, her own maritime fortress of Dunkirk. In Africa, France ceded Senegal, and received back the small island of Gorée. In India, she lost everything she had gained since the peace of Aix la Chapelle, recovered certain trading stations, but renounced the right of building forts or maintaining troops in Bengal. On the day when the preliminaries were signed, France made a secret agreement with Spain, by which she divested herself of the last shred of her possessions on the North American continent. As compensation for Florida, which her luckless ally had lost in her quarrel, she made over to the Spanish crown the city of New Orleans, and under the name of Louisiana gave her the vast region spreading westward from the Mississippi towards the Pacific. On the 9th of December the question of approving the preliminaries came up before both Houses of Parliament. There was a long debate in the Commons. Pitt was not present, confined, it was said, by gout, till late in the day the house was startled by repeated cheers from the outside. The doors opened, and the fallen minister entered, carried in the arms of his servants, and followed by an applauding crowd. His bearers set him down within the bar, and by the help of a crutch he made his way with difficulty to his seat. There was a mixture of the very solemn and the theatric in this apparition, says Walpole, who was present. The moment was so well timed, 
the importance of the man and his services, the languor of his emaciated countenance, and the study bestowed on his dress were circumstances that struck solemnity into a patriot mind, and did a little furnish ridicule to the hardened and insensible. He was dressed in black velvet, his legs and thighs wrapped in flannel, his feet covered with buskins of black cloth, and his hands with thick gloves. Not for the first time he was using his maladies for purposes of stage effect. He spoke for about three hours, sometimes standing and sometimes seated, sometimes with a brief burst of power, more often with the accents of pain and exhaustion. He highly commended the retention of Canada, but denounced the leaving to France a share in the fisheries, as well as other advantages tending to a possible revival of her maritime power. But the commons listened coldly, and by a great majority approved the preliminaries of peace. These preliminaries were embodied in the definitive treaty concluded at Paris on the 10th of February, 1763. Peace between France and England brought peace between the warring nations of the continent. Austria, bereft of her allies and exhausted by vain efforts to crush Frederick, gave up the attempt in despair and signed the Treaty of Hubertsburg. The Seven Years' War was ended. End of section 71. Section 72 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32, 1763 to 1884. Conclusion. This, said Earl Granville on his deathbed, has been the most glorious war and the most triumphant peace that England ever knew. Not all were so well pleased, and many held with Pitt that the House of Bourbon should have been forced to drain the cup of humiliation to the dregs. Yet the fact remains that the Peace of Paris marks an epoch than which none in modern history is more fruitful of grand results. With it began a new chapter in the annals of the world. To borrow the words of a late eminent writer, it is no exaggeration to say that three of the many victories of the Seven Years' War determined for ages to come the destinies of mankind. With that of Rossbach began the recreation of Germany. With that of Plassey, the influence of Europe told for the first time since the days of Alexander on the nations of the East. With the triumph of Wolfe on the heights of Abraham began the history of the United States. So far, however, as concerns the war in the Germanic countries, it was to outward seeming but a mad debauch of blood and rapine, ending in nothing but the exhaustion of the combatants. The havoc had been frightful. According to the King of Prussia's reckoning, 853,000 soldiers of the various nations had lost their lives, besides hundreds of thousands of non-combatants who had perished from famine, exposure, disease, or violence and with all this waste of life not a boundary line had been changed. The rage of the two empresses, and the vanity and spite of the concubine, had been completely foiled. Frederick had defied them all, and had come out of the strife intact in his own hereditary dominions, 
and master of all that he had snatched from the Empress Queen, while Prussia, portioned out by her enemies as their spoil, lay depleted indeed, and faint with deadly striving, but crowned with glory, and with the career before her which, through tribulation and adversity, was to lead her at last to the headship of a united Germany. Through centuries of strife and vicissitude, the French monarchy had triumphed over nobles, parliaments, and people, gathered to itself all the forces of the state, beamed with elusive splendors under Louis the Great, and shone with the phosphorescence of decay under his contemptible successor. Till now, robbed of prestige, burdened with debt, and mined with corruption, it was moving swiftly and more swiftly towards the abyss of ruin. While the war hastened the inevitable downfall of the French monarchy, it produced still more notable effects. France, under Colbert, had embarked on a grand course of maritime and colonial enterprise, and followed it with an activity and vigor that promised to make her a great and formidable ocean power. It was she who led the way in the East, first trained the natives to fight her battles, and began that system of mixed diplomacy and war, which, imitated by her rival, enabled a handful of Europeans to master all India. In North America, her vast possessions dwarfed those of every other nation. She had built up a powerful navy and created an extensive foreign trade. All this was now changed. In India, she was reduced to helpless inferiority, with total ruin in the future, and of all her boundless territories in North America nothing was left but the two island rocks on the coast of Newfoundland that the victors had given her for drying her codfish. Of her navy scarcely forty ships remained, all the rest were captured or destroyed. She was still great on the continent of Europe, but as a world power her grand opportunities were gone. In England, as in France, the several members of the state had battled together since the national life began, and the result had been not the unchecked domination of the crown, but a system of balanced and adjusted forces in which king, nobility, and commons all had their recognized places and their share of power. Thus in the war just ended, two great conditions of success had been supplied. A people instinct with the energies of ordered freedom and a masterly leadership to inspire and direct them. All, and more than all, that France had lost, England had won. Now for the first time she was beyond dispute the greatest of maritime and colonial powers. Portugal and Holland, her precursors in ocean enterprise, had long ago fallen hopelessly behind. Two great rivals remained, and she had humbled the one and swept the other from her path. Spain, with vast American possessions, was sinking into the decay which is one of the phenomena of modern history, while France, of late a most formidable competitor, had abandoned the contest in despair. England was mistress of the seas, and the world was thrown open to her merchants, explorers, and colonists. A few years after the peace, the navigator Cook began his memorable series of voyages, and surveyed the strange and barbarous lands which after times 
were to transform into other Englands, vigorous children of this great mother of nations. It is true that a heavy blow was soon to fall upon her. Her own folly was to alienate the eldest and greatest of her offspring. But nothing could rob her of the glory of giving birth to the United States, and though politically severed, this gigantic progeny were to be not the less a source of growth and prosperity to the parent that bore them, joined with her in a triple kinship of laws, language, and blood. The war, or series of wars, that ended with the Peace of Paris secured the opportunities and set in action the forces that have planted English homes in every clime, and dotted the earth with English garrisons and posts of trade. With the Peace of Paris ended the checkered story of New France, a story which would have been a history if faults of constitution and the bigotry and folly of rulers had not dwarfed it to an episode. Yet it is a noteworthy one in both its lights and its shadows, in the disinterested zeal of the founder of Quebec, the self-devotion of the early missionary martyrs, and the daring enterprise of explorers, in the spiritual and temporal vassalage from which the only escape was to the savagery of the wilderness, and in swarming corruptions which were the natural result of an attempt to rule by the absolute hand of a master beyond the Atlantic, a people bereft of every vestige of civil liberty. Civil liberty was given them by the British sword, but the conqueror left their religious system untouched and through it they have imposed upon themselves a weight of ecclesiastical tutelage that finds few equals in the most Catholic countries of Europe. Such guardianship is not without certain advantages. When faithfully exercised, it aids to uphold some of the tamer virtues, if that can be called a virtue which needs the constant presence of a sentinel to keep it from escaping. But it is fatal to mental robustness and moral courage, and if French Canada would fulfil its aspirations, it must cease to be one of the most priest-ridden communities of the modern world. Scarcely were they free from the incubus of France, when the British provinces showed symptoms of revolt. The measures on the part of the mother country which roused their resentment, far from being oppressive, were less burdensome than the navigation laws to which they had long submitted, and they resisted taxation by Parliament simply because it was in principle opposed to their rights as freemen. They did not, like the American provinces of Spain at a later day, sunder themselves from a parent fallen into decrepitude, but with astonishing audacity they affronted the wrath of England in the hour of her triumph, forgot their jealousies and quarrels, joined hands in the common cause, fought, endured, and won the disunited colonies became the United States. The string of discordant communities along the Atlantic coast has grown to a mighty people, joined in a union which the earthquake of civil war served only to compact and consolidate. Those who in the weakness of their dissensions needed help from England against the savage on their borders, have become a nation that may defy every foe, but that most dangerous of all foes, herself, destined to a majestic future if she will shun the excess and perversion of the principles that made her great. 
prate less about the enemies of the past and strive more against the enemies of the present resist the mob and the demagogue as she resisted parliament and king rally her powers from the race for gold and the delirium of prosperity to make firm the foundations on which that prosperity rests and turn some fair proportion of her vast mental forces to other objects than material progress and the game of party politics she has tamed the savage continent peopled the solitude gathered wealth untold waxed potent imposing redoubtable and now it remains for her to prove if she can that the rule of the masses is consistent with the highest growth of the individual that democracy can give the world a civilization as mature and pregnant ideas as energetic and vitalizing and types of manhood as lofty and strong as any of the systems which it boasts to supplant end of section 72 end of montcalm and wolf by francis parkman jr